following the release of The Amazing Spider-Man, Sony Pictures wanted to launch a cinematic universe, akin to Marvel Studios' Marvel Cinematic Universe. Converging characters, stories, crossovers, the works, with the newly launched Amazing Spider-Man film series sitting at the very heart, giving way to spin-offs including Venom and The Sinister Six. Following the release of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 in 2014, plans swiftly changed as The Amazing Spider-Man 2's box office underperformance proved that Sony's shared universe plans might not be as lucrative as once thought. And so, a deal was struck with Disney for Marvel Studios to co-produce Spider-Man solo films and feature the character in major Marvel Studios crossover events. This, however, did not spell the end for Sony's shared universe plans. Sony's Spider-Man cinematic universe was still going forward, albeit without a Spider-Man, at least for now. Mamma mia, you made it this far into the video and you still haven't subscribed? What in the name of spaghetti and meatballs is this all about? Hey, f you, boy, why you don't subscribe to the channel, pop, yeah? And click on the link in the Patreon in the description below, or I'll fing kill you, boy. Don't fing test me. That's so unspicy meatball. Yes, it is. As of right now, three films have been released in Sony's Spider-Man universe, which we'll abbreviate to the SSU. And in this retrospective, we'll be taking a look at each one, starting with Venom. Venom has been trying to crawl his way to the big screen since before Sony held the cinematic rights to Spider-Man. In 1997, David S. Goyer, yes, that David S. Goyer, penned a Venom movie screenplay for New Line Cinema, which would feature Dolph Lundgren as Venom alongside Carnage as the film's main antagonist. However, the film never materialized. Following Venom's appearance in 2007 Spider-Man 3, Avi Arad announced plans for a Venom spin-off movie, and it's hard to call how this would have played out. Assuming that it would take place in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man universe, where Venom was killed off. Dude literally got disintegrated, there's not really any coming back from that. Then for the rebooted Amazing Spider-Man universe, Venom was one of the first spin-offs planned under this new label, with Channing Tatum set to play Eddie Brock and Josh Trank set to direct. But of course, the Amazing Spider-Man franchise sank in the Hudson River, and spin-off plans along with it. Following the Spidey Summit where the deal was struck for Sony and Disney to co-produce Spider-Man movies together, Amy Pascal, Avi Arad, and Matt Tolmack would fish out their old spin-off plans, give them a quick blow-dry, and get to work, with Venom as the new face of their SSU. There are few comic book villains that film studios have been so hell-bent on bringing to the big screen in absence of their heroic counterparts as Venom. And I kinda get it. Avi Arad is very much the man who'd lead the charge for Venom to make it for the big screen, and before Avi Arad made a name for himself as a film producer, he was the chairman of Toy Biz, a company which specialized in Marvel action figures, namely the Marvel Legends line in the 90s and early 2000s. And say what you will about the man, he makes a good toy. But with this relationship with Marvel merchandise, he would have some understanding of what characters would sell. During the 90s and early 2000s, Venom was a character that would simply print money, also being one of the few Marvel Comics villains to receive his very own spin-off comic series. Venom has a fascinating backstory, and it relates to Spider-Man in a far more intimate fashion than most of Spidey's rogues gallery, but he's also proven to be a highly versatile character. Yes, his hatred of Spider-Man was a defining trait in the beginning, however, Venom would also develop a moral code in that he would not harm innocents, and that his beef was purely with Spider-Man. But even then, Venom proved capable of squashing that beef and being more amicable with Spidey, going so far as to team up to battle Carnage and move on from his feud with Spidey, pursuing a new destiny as the lethal protector in San Francisco. At this point, Venom had made a name for himself as more of an anti-hero figure. Venom is versatile, which means he's ripe for story potential. He can move freely through various different genres, and the character's popularity virtually guaranteed a sizable army of Benjamin Franklins would be waltzing their way through Sony's door. Venom is a perfect storm, an anti-hero, a dark mirror character. 
And everybody knows everyone loves a Dark Mirror character. And in 2018, his big solo movie would finally materialize. From director Ruben Fleischer, starring Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock and Venom, marking the start of the SSU, with Venom taking up the central spot from Spider-Man, who was absent from this universe entirely, at least at this stage. Other cast members included Michelle Williams as Anne Weying. In the comics, Anne Weying was the ex-wife of Eddie Brock, who would go on to become She-Venom. Riz Ahmed was also cast as Carlton Drake, aka Riot, who would be the main antagonist for this film. The Venom movie would be drawing cues from the Lethal Protector comic run, with Eddie Brock living in San Francisco. This would also explain Spider-Man's absence from the story beyond studio politics, in a way that general audience members could probably understand. This new version of Venom would be bringing in more of the superficial aspects of the character than his Spider-Man 3 counterpart. This Venom was hulking in size, a fully CGI creation, and would embrace the dual personality aspects of the character. Where this version of the character deviates a bit more than his Spider-Man 3 counterpart is that any and all relation to Spider-Man is stripped away, even going so far as to remove the classic iconic spider symbol, later retconned into a dragon symbol in the 2018 Venom comic run. Which, uh, how, how did we not see that actually? I still prefer it as a spider, I don't care. With this, Venom had to be given a new origin story independent of Spider-Man, and this is what I feel is the 2018 film's greatest downfall. Venom can work independently, however his origin story, I personally feel, is strictly dependent on Spider-Man, given that he inherits the symbiote from him, and their mutual hatred of Spider-Man is the initial motivation. To remove this is to remove an integral layer of the character. But you also lose the appeal of Venom being a dark reflection to Spider-Man. And it's really funny because a lot of this film's marketing relied on Venom being this subversion, this counter-character, but to uh, nothing in the film itself. In fact, Venom is a pretty clean-cut heroic character in this film, just one who bites people's heads off as opposed to tying them up and waiting for the cops to arrive. So, John Jameson returns from a space exhibition led by the Life Foundation with four samples of a symbiotic species. However, one of the symbiotes goes rogue and crashes the spaceship in Malaysia where it hops from host to host. The other three samples take residence at the Life Foundation in San Francisco under the care of Carlton Drake. Eddie Brock is making waves as an investigative reporter with his very own show. He asks the hard questions that people really want to hear. Admittedly, I don't quite buy Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock as an investigative reporter when he's portrayed as this piping hot mess throughout the entirety of this film. But I'll say this, Tom Hardy is the absolute best thing in this film. His performance as Eddie Brock, even before his life is changed by the symbiote, is just so chaotic, yet oddly charming and charismatic at the same time, all while being done in the most goofy way possible. It's just an oddly multi-layered performance for such a simple character. So Eddie, with his balls of steel, is going to take on the Life Foundation, investigating their inhumane procedures as they experiment on society's most vulnerable using the symbiotes, to determine genetic matches between symbiotes and their human hosts. Eddie doesn't realize that he's playing with fire and Carlton Drake has him fired. His life at this point falls apart as he's out of a job, and his fiancée Anne leaves him as he's also kinda cost her her job too. It's also worth noting that Eddie and Anne have absolutely zero chemistry in this film, so maybe it's okay that they went split skis. Also, Anne's new partner, Dr. Dan Lewis, is just a super nice du- Hey, wrong picture, but that's not the- Anyway. Months later, Eddie is approached by a Dr. Dora, who seeks to expose the truth about the Life Foundation with Eddie's help. And so the two break in, where Eddie discovers that his homeless friend Maria is being experimented on using the symbiote. He goes to rescue her and becomes bonded with the symbiote himself, and he manages to escape, now imbued with new abilities thanks to being a match with the symbiote. 
So for the rest of this film, it's this goose chase as the Life Foundation are hunting Eddie and Venom down, with Anne in tow as she tries to protect Eddie. The rogue symbiote in Malaysia makes its way back to the Life Foundation. And it bonds with Carlton Drake as he becomes Riot and plans to set off into the stars in search of his symbiotic brethren. And it's up to Eddie, Venom, and Anne to stop Riot and ground his rocket. And that's basically the film. Venom is a very middle-of-the-road film, but it's not without its merits. The second half is definitely the stronger half of the film as Eddie and Venom are bonded. Even before Venom properly appears, interesting things are done with the symbiote as it helps Eddie fight off the Life Foundation agents in his apartment. But without a doubt, the best thing in this film is the dynamic between Eddie and Venom as two characters. This film leans much more into the dual personality than even the comics did, as Eddie and his new alien Bezzy mate are constantly interacting with each other from the halfway point. Tom Hardy also lends his voice to the symbiote, and he does a great job, not sounding too dissimilar from Venom's voice in the Spider-Man 2000 video game, which is, in my opinion, the best voice Venom has ever had. And Weying also becomes a much better character in the second half, as in spite of their breakup, she still seeks to look after Eddie as a friend, concerned about the long-term effects Venom could have on Eddie's health, and that he's going to get himself killed being the erratic hero that he is. Eddie is clearly out of his depth this entire time, and I appreciate that they never compromise on this by empowering him. It's always the symbiote doing the work. And there's no glamorization here, so to speak. No shirtless scene to show off how much the actor worked out for the role. Eddie is just constantly wearing the same sweat-drenched gray hoodie, and I really appreciate the extents this film goes to avoid glamorizing Eddie Brock. There's also a fun nod to She-Venom, as the symbiote briefly bonds with Anne to find Eddie again. The supporting cast can also be a lot of fun, with Mrs. Chen running the local shop that Eddie and Venom frequent, and Dr. Dan Lewis, who just seems like a nice dude who's out of his depth in this story. It definitely takes a little too long to get to this stage, though. The scenes of the symbiote making its way from Malaysia to San Francisco to bond with Carlton Drake could easily have been cut. There was no reason to have this long-winded of a process to get Carlton his own symbiote, when the dude already has, like, three of them. We could easily have had it so that one of the symbiotes Drake is testing on chooses to bond with him by force, and from there he becomes Riot. This brings me to what is in my opinion the weakest aspect of the film, Carlton Drake, aka Riot. Riz Ahmed does his best with the material he's given, but Carlton Drake is every generic evil scientist of the contemporary era. Dude has nefarious intentions that he's masking with noble motivations to protect the world from climate change or whatever. He's got this holier-than-thou attitude, but he's got a short temper behind the scenes. He'll recite Bible verses to his victims. He's all philosophical and deep. It's another corporation that boasts good intent that isn't as good as it seems on the surface. And just... Ugh, the Life Foundation. Could you get more on the nose than it being called the Life Foundation. Carlton Drake feels like what you would get if you asked ChatGPT to write a villain for this film, and because of that, even when he's infused with his own symbiote, it's just difficult for me to engage with the action because this character is so utterly bland. And yeah, that final battle is pretty visual vomity, especially with how much Venom and Riot kind of blend in with one another. They just don't look different enough to each other. Admittedly, that was a problem with Riot's comic design as well, and they've actually improved it a little here by giving him more of a silvery look, but even so, it is quite hard to tell the two apart. Tonally, this film is also pretty confused, as it tries to go for a somewhat contemporary grounded in science approach, while also having moments that strike me as unintentionally corny and tropey to the point of accidental comedy. I'm still not quite sure how I was supposed to react to the She-Venom scene. Also, why does the film look like that? It's going for the nihilistic approach, lots of blue, it's so blue, so gritty, despite its incredibly over-the-top lead character. As this body horror buddy sci-fi movie, Venom is alright. In superficial aspects, Venom is done pretty well. Tom Hardy plays the dual role well. Dual roles being something he's effectively got down to a science at this point. Venom looks good, and on a surface level, he seems at least somewhat faithful to the character in the comics. But the moral ambiguity that made this character so great, so versatile, is not explored. 
And yes, it is reductive that this version of Venom has lost any and all ties to Spider-Man with nothing new put in its place. This new origin for Venom is just bland. Venom is a run-off-the-mill superhero film, but it's not without its fun moments. Also, the film did gangbusters, it clearly did something right. At the box office, it raked in 856 million globally making Venom, with its $100 million budget, a complete success. So inevitably, a sequel was on the horizon, following on from the post credit stinger, including Woody Harrelson as Cletus Cassidy in the funniest Krusty the Clown looking wig I've ever seen in my entire life. So that brings us to the second installment in the SSU, Venom Let There Be Carnage from 2021. It was a no-brainer that Carnage would be introduced into the Venom movie sooner rather than later, to the extent that I'm honestly kind of surprised we didn't get Carnage in the first film. For me, this immediately set Venom 2 off on better footing than its predecessor. Riot was a bland, weak villain, but Carnage is one of both Spidey and Venom's greatest adversaries, with him being Venom's arch nemesis outside of Spider-Man. Joining Carnage will be his love interest Francis Barrison, aka Shriek, as played by Naomi Harris as a secondary antagonist. Also joining the cast is Stephen Graham as Patrick Mulligan, and for those of you who don't know, in the comics, Patrick Mulligan goes on to become Toxin. Director Ruben Fleischer was otherwise occupied with other projects, so he did not return for Venom Let Debbie Carnage. Instead, we have Andy Serkis directing. Now, this isn't his first rodeo in the director's chair, but it's probably his most high-profile project to date as a director. Given his history and understanding of bringing computer-generated monsters to life, he seemed like a great fit for the Venom movies based on that alone. So how did they do this time? The film begins at St. Estes Reform School in 1996, where Cletus Cassidy and Francis Barrison reside, and we see that the two take comfort in each other. This facility is like something out of an old-fashioned horror story, pure haunted mansion kind of stuff, indicating a much more confidently cartoony tone than its predecessor from the get-go. Due to her supernatural abilities, Frances is being transferred to Ravencroft by the San Francisco Police Department as Officer Patrick Mulligan rides with her. She attacks him with her supersonic scream, permanently impairing his hearing. Defending himself, he shoots her in the eye, believing her to be dead, However, her survival is covered up as she now resides in Ravencroft, all until the present day. Francis reads in the paper that Cletus Cassidy may be getting the death sentence in an article written by Eddie Brock, and we transition to a shot of Cletus in the San Francisco prison as he stares down the camera before we cut to the title card. Immediately, this film is more tonally confident than its predecessor, setting up two larger-than-life villains and their motivations within each other. Ravencroft and St. Estes are both very stylized locations, leaning far more into horror camp. From here, we follow Eddie Brock, as he's approached by Detective Patrick Mulligan to talk to Cletus Cassidy. With Eddie Brock being the only reporter ever to interview him, Cassidy gains a sense of kinship with him, a sense of trust. Following their talk, Venom deduces where the carcasses of Cletus Cassidy's victims are hidden, giving Eddie, as a reporter, the scoop of a lifetime. This leads to the state making the decision to execute Cletus Cassidy by lethal injection. Meanwhile, Anne Weying invites Eddie to dinner to tell him that she'll be marrying Dr. Dan Lewis. Kinda weird to invite your still infatuated ex to dinner to reveal to them that you're marrying someone else, but go off I guess. Venom has a lot of objections and Eddie just feels like garbage, so Venom promises to Eddie that he'll look after him and get him through this. So Eddie receives an invitation from Cletus to attend his execution. In the invitation, Cletus reveals his origins to Eddie, and we get an excellent directorial decision. Cletus's origins are told in the form of animation that resembles the scroll of the invitation card. Not only is this animation an excellent way of recounting Cletus's origins with a great deal of charm and creativity, but I also love how we transition between animation and live action, with Eddie and Cletus both rotoscoped in front of the footage, facing each other as Cletus tells his story. What a genuinely great sequence. So Eddie goes to talk with Cletus who berates and insults him for getting him killed. Venom decides he's had enough and attacks Cletus. Defending himself, Cletus bites Eddie's hand and notes that Eddie's blood doesn't taste like human blood. 
Interesting that that's the tell when the massive alien tendrils just came out of Eddie, but this movie is going for such a wacky cartoony tone that I can almost look past such a dumb moment. But don't get it twisted, it's really dumb. So tensions are rising between Eddie and Venom. Living with an alien symbiote isn't easy, but for Venom, living with a human who doesn't understand your needs is no easier. Eddie forbids Venom from eating human brains, making the compromise of chicken and chocolate in their place. Venom wants to set out into the night as the lethal protector, apprehending criminals and eating them. Because they're bad guys, so it's okay to eat them. One of my favorite scenes in this film is when Venom raids a chicken coop and decides he's done with the compromise, instead opting to apprehend a criminal who's already been taken care of, as he threatens to use the criminal's head for bowling. Now, here I want to quickly talk about Venom's characterization, as there's quite a departure from the first film. In the first film, Venom was a lot less expressive. There was a little more distance between him and Eddie as he'd quietly whisper banter to Eddie. In this film though, Venom is significantly more boisterous and loud, leaning far more into the banter between Eddie and Venom. Venom is also a lot more emotional and affectionate too. Highlighting this, Tom Hardy has changed up his Venom voice from more of an alien whisper from the first film to a more expressive, less modulated voice, far more in line with the Venom voice from the Spider-Man 2000 video game. This is a far more deliberately comedic portrayal of the character, and while in this story he and Eddie are very much at odds with one another, there is far more chemistry and affection between the two, as Let There Be Carnage leans heavily into the bromance angle. Now with those tensions established, Eddie and Venom finally come to blows in Eddie's apartment, leading the two to separation. Venom just wants to be appreciated as the asset that he is to Eddie, but Eddie views him as more of a burden. I think my favorite part of this fight is when Venom tells Eddie to take his stuff and leave, despite it being Eddie's apartment. Tom Hardy, once again, is excellent. Not only has he improved as a more refined version of Venom, but there's far more physical interaction this time between him and Venom, and the fight between the two is actually believable on screen. And this may be thanks to Andy Serkis' direction, as mocap monsters are kind of his bread and butter. So yeah, the two separate, Venom hops to some new hosts while trashing up Eddie's motorcycle, which is poor form Venom. And so the two, yeah, they finally parted ways. So the big day is here. Cletus is being executed, and Eddie is nowhere to be seen. But the lethal injection fails, interrupted by the Red Symbiote. Cletus breaks loose, and aided by the Red Symbiote carnage, the two destroy the prison, killing various guards, and escape into San Francisco to find Francis and break her free. Mulligan calls Brock to inform him of the situation, and warn him. Carnage and Cletus get to know each other as they steal a car and make their way to Ravencroft, and... I won't lie, Carnage's voice is not quite how I'd hoped it would be. Now that's not an objective criticism by any means, as I don't think there's any right or wrong way of doing Carnage's voice really, but I guess my first time hearing these characters talk was in the Spider-Man 2000 video game, and in that, D. Bradley Baker gave Carnage more of a squealy, unhinged voice, offsetting Venom's deeper gravelly tones. Here, Carnage's voice is even deeper than Venom's, I guess I just wanted a bit more contrast between Venom and Carnage, but this is still fine for what it is. So Venom's jumping from host to host, but due to incompatibilities, it rarely lasts. He finds a new host and heads into a Halloween party, free to express himself, and the crowd absolutely love him, believing him to be just a really good costume. This scene is honestly kind of adorable. Venom and Eddie have been pretty unreasonable towards each other over the course of the film, but here, Venom is finally out of hiding, and he's basking in the love, able to be himself, to be seen. There's also some major queer coding in here, as Venom announces that he's out of the Eddie closet, which is just, that's a cute little highlight. But as his host begins failing outside of the club, Venom regrets that Eddie couldn't see him tonight. So we cut to Ravencroft, where one of the nurses tells Francis that Cletus is free, but she'll never get to see him. They really play up the whole inmate abuse thing. It feels like something out of Batman Arkham Asylum. Suddenly, Cletus appears in front of her, inside Francis' containment area. He uses Carnage to kill the nurse and break Francis out of her cell, and the two head to St. Estes to burn the place down. The three agree to marry, each with their own guest. Shriek wants Patrick Mulligan, Cletus wants Eddie, 
and Carnage wants Venom. But this trio has one key problem. Shriek's power is supersonic screaming. The symbiote's weaknesses are fire and sound. So while Cletus is very protective of Shriek, Carnage is not and repeatedly threatens her. As we saw when Carnage and Shriek first break out of Ravencroft and are attacked by a police helicopter. With Cletus and Shriek now free, Mulligan brings Eddie in for questioning. Eddie refuses to answer Mulligan's questions and calls in Anne as his lawyer. When she finds out he's no longer bonded with Venom, she goes in search of the symbiote who she finds in Mrs. Chen. She seduces Venom to agree to bond with her to poor Dr. Dan's dismay. And so she, Venom, and Dr. Dan go to bust Eddie out of police custody. We also get a fun throwback to she Venom in the previous film. No kiss this time, which is a relief because seriously, I don't think poor Dr. Dan could take it. Venom refuses to rebond with Eddie unless he apologizes, which he does, and Venom really milks this. Venom and Eddie then set out to take down Carnage, but not without first smacking poor Dr. Dan. And so the Red Wedding goes forward. Shriek kidnaps Anne and uses Dr. Dan to lure Eddie and Venom in. Cletus overpowers Detective Mulligan and kidnaps him. They all arrive at the church, and when Venom discovers that Carnage is a Red symbiote, he initially bails, but eventually agrees to help when Eddie tells him that he can eat everyone except the priest played by... Wait, Reese Shearsmith? Did not expect to see him here. So it took us until the third act, but we finally get the fight we all came here to see. Venom versus Carnage, and I tell you what, it's worth the wait. It's not the level of visual vomit that the Venom vs. Riot from the first film was, and given that Carnage is red, he's far easier to track in all the CGI craziness. I also just love some of Venom's little quips and Tom Hardy's delivery, a particular favorite being when Shriek screams and Carnage tells her to shut her mouth, to which Venom responds, Marriage trouble? Already? That was, that was my attempt. Venom is just so boisterous and lovable in this film. Dr. Dan then uses gasoline and a lighter to set Carnage and Venom on fire, so we get a moment of Eddie and Cletus fighting Mano y Mano before their symbiotes reform. Shriek hangs Detective Mulligan by chain suffocating him, getting her revenge for him shooting her in the eye. Carnage manages to trap Venom under a collapsing part of the church, and he decides he's going to kill Anne. Carnage starts to grow, and uh, admittedly I didn't have Kaiju Carnage on my bingo card, but here we are. I'm not exactly sure how the Carnage symbiote achieves this, but it's a spectacle, and Carnage does seem pretty unstoppable in this fight. So Dr. Dan, the literal MVP, goes to help Venom out of the rubble to save Anne, but Venom has kind of given up, believing Carnage to be unstoppable. But Eddie is able to divert Venom's attention to what's going on at the top of the spire. Shriek tells Cletus he needs to stop Carnage, as him growing to kaiju form and trying to kill Anne is just a couple of steps too far for her. So Carnage tries to suffocate Shriek, as Cletus tries to fight off Carnage to protect her. At this point, Venom realizes his advantage. Carnage and Cletus are not a perfect match like he and Eddie are, so they may stand a chance if they work together as the lethal protector. It's a really nice cheesy moment, but there's an interesting change from the source material here. See, in the comics, it's very much the reverse. The advantage Carnage has over Venom is that the symbiote and Cletus are so in tune that they don't even view each other as separate entities. There's no, we are Carnage, Carnage is one singular entity. The symbiote and Cletus are one. So it's kind of bizarre that Carnage's weakness in this film is literally the opposite of that character trait. It's a departure from the source material, but as I've said before, different doesn't have to mean bad. I'll talk a bit more about this later though, as it is dependent on some context in the greater picture. So Venom gives it all he has to rescue Anne as he's constantly impaled by Carnage. The guy takes one hell of a beating and he's clearly exhausted. He realizes that the only way to defeat Carnage is to use Shriek to his advantage. He pushes her down the bell tower and as she falls she screams, and as she screams, the symbiotes disperse. Venom briefly bonding with Anne and Dan to make it to the ground so that he can catch Eddie from his fall. With no allies, Carnage and Cletus just slam into the ground. Venom eats Carnage and picks up Cletus for his final words, that all he wanted was Eddie's friendship. Venom yells, FUCK THIS GUY, and eats his head. It's a hilarious scene. I love Venom's disregard for Cletus as he just berates him and throws his carcass aside. 
We'll talk a bit more about this scene as well once we get to more kind of my concluding thoughts about this film. Because I do have quite a bit to say. It's revealed that Detective Mulligan survived as his eyes glow, possibly setting up Toxin for the next film. Venom and Eddie realize that after Cletus' breakout, they need to lay low and go into hiding. So they part ways with Sonny and Cher, their pet chickens, and set off for Hawaii so they can go be the lethal protector elsewhere. And so the film ends with Venom confessing love for Eddie. Then we get the mid-credits. Now, if you've seen my No Way Home retrospective, you'll know that while I refuse to elaborate there, I said No Way Home had the worst mid-credits scene I'd ever seen. Maybe a little hyperbolic, but genuinely it kind of sits in my memory as, yeah, one of the worst after credits I've ever seen. It was a scene that felt like a joke at the audience's expense. Here's why. So in the mid-credits scene for Venom 2, Venom tells Eddie that the symbiotes have a hive mind of knowledge that spans across multiverses. Venom tries to reveal some of that knowledge to Eddie, but he's interrupted when the two are transported to another dimension. On the TV in this new dimension is the news report revealing Spider-Man's secret identity to the world, Venom implying that he knows Spider-Man. Now that scene in itself is hype as hell. Even though this version of Venom doesn't truly have a history with Spider-Man beyond the symbiote hive mind, the idea of seeing Venom and Spider-Man finally meeting is so exciting. Not only that, but the SSU and the MCU crossing over? Whatever my thoughts on these movies are, seeing Spider-Man and his most beloved adversary finally meeting, count me in. Which is why I was absolutely livid when in Spider-Man No Way Home's mid-credits, just as Venom was about to go find Spider-Man, he was transported back to the SSU, separated from Spider-Man albeit with part of the symbiote remaining in the MCU. So you mean to tell me, you sent Venom to the MCU to do literally nothing? Okay, he served to introduce the symbiote to the MCU. But you could have just done that in literally any other way. Have an asteroid crash, have a spaceship land. You mean to tell me you couldn't justify a symbiote just materializing in this universe where cosmic stuff is just bread and butter to this world? You had to tease me with a crossover you had no intentions of following up? Dookie! Dookie. Again, a joke at the audience's expense. Do you see me laughing? I'm not amused. So okay, Venom let there be carnage. Well, it feels like these Venom movies have comfortably settled into their own mold. Venom 2 feels less like the contemporary blockbuster the first film tried to be, instead a film that lead into the cornier aspects of the first one. Tonally, yeah, this is basically a throwback to the Joel Schumacher Batman movies. But it works here. Venom 2 is just this over-the-top monster movie from start to finish. It's unwaveringly chaotic and goofy. There's a lot more variation in the visuals when compared to the first Venom as well. It's less blue-graded and nihilistic than its predecessor. The symbiotes are utilized far more creatively, and I think that speaks to Andy Serkis' confidence with CGI monsters and how to make them feel tangible and just how to have fun with them. Venom and Eddie are intensely likable leads, and the side characters of Anne, Dr. Dan, and Mrs. Chen have all gotten a lot more to do this time, to the point where I actually feel some attachment to this cast. Dr. Dan being the MVP of the bunch. Obviously, the film benefits from having much better antagonists than its predecessor. You can't really go wrong with Carnage. He's a sadistic psychopath bonded with an alien symbiote. Like, you can't really get that wrong. And his dynamic with Shriek and how, given Shriek's abilities, they kind of end up as little star-crossed lovers, that's a really fun dynamic. Heck, with Carnage's interactions with Shriek, we ended up with a better live-action portrayal of the Joker and Harley's relationship than anything the DCEU ever gave us. Now, I mentioned earlier that, yes, there is a fundamental aspect of Carnage that was changed for this film. That being the discord between Cletus and Carnage as Carnage's weakness when compared with Venom. I'm okay with that on the basis that Carnage is not a recurring villain in these films. If he were a returning character, I feel like we'd need to address that, otherwise Venom just immediately has an upper hand at all times, beyond just, you know, power anyway. Where in the comics, it took Spider-Man, Venom, and the Fantastic Four teaming up to take down Carnage in his first appearance. So okay, this works if we treat Carnage as a one and done. 
But that brings me to my biggest issue with this film. Carnage shouldn't just be a one and done. Outside of Spider-Man, Carnage is Venom's arch nemesis. You don't just kill him off in the first appearance. Now, okay, they killed the Joker off in Batman 89, they killed off Green Goblin in Spider-Man 1, sure, sure. But here's the thing. Spider-Man and Batman have a massive wealth of beloved rogues that they can follow up with. With Venom, yes, he does have some other adversaries like Null and Toxin, but here's the problem. Nobody knows or even cares who they are. I'm saying this as someone who loves Toxin. Also, with Venom being a good guy in this universe, I have no idea why he and Toxin would even fight. Maybe it'll be Venom and Toxin versus Null for Venom 3, which actually, admittedly, I'm warming up to that more as we speak. It made a lot of sense to me to have Venom's adversary in Movie 3 be Spider-Man, but that appears to be off the table at this point, at least for now. When you kill Carnage, where do you really go from there? Beyond that, on its own two feet, I love Venom Let There Be Carnage. It's unabashedly dumb popcorn fun. It's a film that feels comfortable in its own skin, which actually ended up being a theme of the film, and it's consistently entertaining from start to finish. You got some great characters, scenery chewing villains, scenery chewing heroes, big action, great visuals, all packed into 90 minutes. Venom Let There Be Carnage, it's just a treat of a movie. And I can see this one achieving cult status in the next 10 years or so, and you can guarantee I will absolutely be a part of that cult. All right, so moving along to the third film in the SSU, we're moving along to 2022, we have Morbius, starring Jared Leto. Now with Venom, it was a no-brainer, of course he could carry his own film and it would sell just fine. Morbius? Well, nobody asked to see Morbius in a Spider-Man movie, let alone his own standalone film, but Okay, you don't need to ask for a film to exist for it to justify itself, otherwise there'd be no original IPs. Morbius is the living vampire, science, and vampires. You can make a vampire movie with a sciencey twist, surely. Just depends on if anyone's interested. I wasn't rushing out to my local cinema to see Morbius because I'm not massive on vampires. That said, Sony wanted us to go see it, as the trailer was littered with references to Spider-Man from appearances of Adrian Toomes, as played by Michael Keaton returning from Spider-Man Homecoming, through to Morbius passing by a graffitied image of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man with the word murderer scrawled across it. Sony wanted to let you know Morbius connects to Spider-Man. And lo and behold, all of Keaton's stuff was in post-credits and the Spider-Man Easter egg was made strictly for the trailers. Well, that's sleazy. Okay, so, Morbius, 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 what happened in Morbius? Come on, pup, you just saw this film a couple of days ago, surely you can chuck something out there? Okay, I think I got it. So, Michael Morbius has a fatal blood disorder, and he grew up with a kid called Milo who shares that same blood disorder. And so, the two kind of bond over that. They're adopted by the director of the hospital, Nicholas, who sends Michael Morbius to medical school in New York, believing him to be gifted. Michael Morbius grows up to become a renowned doctor, turning down a Nobel Prize for his creation of artificial blood. With this artificial blood in his arsenal, Morbius experiments on vampire bat DNA to create a cure for his condition. Anyway, yeah, Morbius told Milo what his plans were ahead of time, and Milo gave him money for a submarine so he could do his illegal bat experiment in international waters. With that, he becomes Batman. Quite literally, very Batman begins sounding music plays while the dude is surrounded by bats and stuff, to the point that I'm surprised Christopher Nolan hasn't served them a lawsuit. So he becomes a vampire and kills all his colleagues before coming to his senses and erasing all the evidence. Some hero. Way to take responsibility there, Michael Moebius. So Morbius returns to New York to discover he has superpowers. And okay, admittedly, the portrayal of the powers is kind of cool. How he moves around and his body goes all streaky. And how his bat echolocation is conveyed with his irises looking all shredded and the room being scanned. Those shredded irises make me very uncomfortable and I'd imagine it's incredibly itchy. But this is cool creative stuff. There are some good directorial decisions going on here. So Morbius becomes kind of addicted to his artificial blood but starts realizing that this can't sustain him forever. So Morbius refuses to use his cure on Milo due to being a vampire. And Milo's pissed. Because he's dying, you can't make him die more. But Morbius is concerned that the cure could do something worse and turn him into a monster. Wait, where have I heard this all before? 
two childhood best friends. One of them refuses to use his gift to cure the other. Oh, Sony! Find a new party trick already. I can't remember exactly how, but Milo uses Morbius's methods to cure himself, transforming himself into a vampire, and goes on a vampiric rampage. Michael and Milo fight in Notting Hill Gate Underground Ste- I mean, the New York subways. And again, when the film goes for action, it does get pretty visually inventive. The vampire powers in this film are legitimately kind of cool. So Michael finds a new research lab and begins working on an antidote for the vampire stuff. The adoptive father begs Milo to sort himself out, and Milo kills him. Milo goes off and kills Morbius' girlfriend. When Morbius finds her, she dies in his arms. He sets out to battle with Milo and uses an army of bats, Batman Begins style, to restrain Milo so he can administer the antidote. And so Milo dies. But I thought Morbius really didn't want to fight Milo simply because he's like a brother to him and he didn't want to hurt him and now he's here letting him die, but like sooner. This is really weird. There might be something I'm missing though because I can't remember this movie at all. Morbius then flies off with the bats and it turns out his girlfriend is alive and a vampire because she accidentally ingested some of Milo's blood when he fed on her. Morbius now lives out his days as a fugitive vampire. The mid-credits is Adrian Toomes appearing in the SSU, and the post-credits is him teaming up with Morbius, somehow retrieving his Vulture tech, surmising that the multiversal disturbance must have something to do with Spider-Man. Alrighty, so admittedly, this whole Morbius section of this video probably felt like a bit of an afterthought. I probably don't sound very enthusiastic, and I apologize, but that's because I'm not. There's nothing in this film here to warrant me getting out of bed in the morning, let alone me going to the cinema to see it. This movie is not so bad it's good like the internet had me initially believe. It's just dull. It's not without its highlights though. The intro and credits have cool purple triangle aesthetics that I kind of like. Matt Smith as Milo is very watchable. Milo is a pretty bland character as far as villains go, but Matt Smith does well to elevate the material. Dude's just a fun actor. I liked him in this, I really liked him in Last Night in Soho, and I liked him in Doctor Who, obviously, so I think Matt Smith is always one to watch. There's this poop my pants dance, which was also really bizarre. It comes out of nowhere, and it feels like it's setting up the final battle, but then the movie just goes on and on and on from there. It's not a particularly long film, but it feels it because so much of it is just Morbius dicking around with test tubes. The pacing is appalling. Whenever it feels like it's going to kick into high gear, it's time for more research and test tubes. If you've got a boner for test tubes, this film is for you. Also, I do want to talk a little bit about the lighting in this film, because there's some strange choices going on here. It reminds me of, like, student lighting projects back when I was at university, with it commonly consisting of blue light on the left and pink light on the right. I suppose it's kind of cool, but it doesn't feel all that purposeful, and it really just feels very student. Probably my biggest takeaway from this is how New York looks like London, because it's all shot in London. And it looks like London, I don't know if that's just because of the fact that I live in London, but it, it looks like London. Now the Vulture twist actually, in retrospect, now makes sense. When I was chatting with my buddy Quinton Reviews after watching Across the Spider-Verse, he was telling me how it makes sense of Morbius' Vulture Twist. See, the Vulture Twist is dependent on Spider-Man No Way Home. That's how Vulture makes it into the SSU. But in Spider-Man No Way Home, it was all made pretty cut and dry. People that came to the MCU all went back home thanks to Doctor Strange's spell. But in Across the Spider-Verse, it's set up that the Alchemax Collider disrupted the multiverse to a point of displacement and tearing. That kind of makes sense of Morbius, and I'm wondering if that was intentional and Sony were just playing a long game. Kind of smart when you think about it, if that's the case. I don't have much to say about Morbius. Its greatest crime is just being dull and uninteresting. The vampire power stuff is cool, but it represents so little of the film, and at that point, you're really only watching for some visual flair. I feel like Sony were kind of aware of how uninteresting this film is, with how aggressive they were with including Spider-Man and Marvel Universe nods in the promotional material. Then when the film gained its ironic reputation, I think they kind of tried viewing it as like the next The Room, and re-released it for a second theatrical run at Fan Persuasion. When I say Fan Persuasion, I really mean folks that were just joking about the movie online. It's really, really funny, though, that Sony re-released this film for a second run, and it still managed to flop. 
I want to be clear, there's nothing ironically good about this film. There's no ironic enjoyment for me. The most entertainment I got out of this film was me and my roommate pronouncing Michael Moebius with the silliest accents we could. It's a nothing movie, and the idea of it existing as a tentpole blockbuster is ten times funnier than the experience of actually watching it. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen. It's just not notable enough, which, if anything, is more egregious because I'd want my time back if not for the fact that I'm making this video, and I'm so gonna monetize it. If I'd paid to see this in theaters, I'd definitely want my money back. So that's the SSU so far, and what a mediocre serving. There's nothing outright egregious here. The worst crime any of this commits is Morbius being dull, but Venom is perfectly middle of the road, and I dare say Venom Let There Be Carnage is a lot of fun, easily the highlight of this trilogy. It's bizarre to think that these movies come from the same studio as the Spider-Verse animated movies, which represent some of the best of what the cinematic experience has to offer right now. Across the Spider-Verse is my pick for film of the year of all of the new releases I've seen this year, and it's not even close. But with that, the world keeps turning, Sony keeps trying. I just saw the trailer for the new Kraven the Hunter movie, and honestly, it looks alright. I think Kraven definitely justifies a film more than Morbius does. Admittedly, the bar is subterranean at this point. Also, using other Spidey villains here was a good choice. The idea of Kraven facing off against Rhino sounds honestly kind of exciting, and I'm looking forward to the Rhino getting a second shot. I'm not sure why we need to see these characters' childhoods almost every movie, though. I'm not sure if I can bring myself to give a hoot about Kraven the Hunter's childhood. My main takeaway is that the trailer doesn't look bad, but this would all be far more exciting with Spider-Man in there. It feels like there's something missing without him. There's a few nods to him in Venom 2 with a spider crawling up Cletus' arm and a joke about responsibility being for the mediocre, plus an actual name drop in Morbius, so it sounds like they are building up to something. We've also got the Madam Web movie on the way, where Madam Web assembles an all-female team of spider people for reasons we don't yet know, but it's speculated that they are here to protect Richard Parker to ensure Peter Parker is born, which would mean more predetermined Destiny stuff which I'm just never going to like. Then we've also got El Muerto, which sounds like the ultimate barrel scraping, as the guy is just a wrestler who appeared in like two comics, but according to the synopsis, this might be the first we see of the SSU Spider-Man. As the film features a wrestler granted superpowers by a mysterious mask, who fought Spider-Man in a charity wrestling match. He'd almost go on to unmask Spider-Man before Spider-Man stung him with a paralyzing poison. Wait, Spider-Man doesn't sting people. Unless... Unless... Hang on. Amy Pascal recently confirmed a live-action Miles Morales Spider-Man was on the way. Is Miles Morales the Spider-Man of the SSU? Abort it, abort it, get rid- no, 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 I will not have you dragging Miles Morales into this calamity. Some things are sacred, goddammit! So what do you guys think? What do you think of this video? What do you think of these movies? Comment below, discuss, the floor is yours. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button. And if you want your name in the credits of all these videos, as well as other perks, such as additional content, you can do so by donating as little as a dollar a month via Patreon link in the description below. An extra special shout out goes to the patrons in the $10 or above tier. Uh, not sure what I'm gonna do to make the shout out special this time. You know what? I'm gonna mispronounce all of your names. So we've got Dara Dean Y, Kali Bean Eat, Vate Jodor. Oh, you are taking the piss. Kink Akka Kinjai Kabani Akka Tahi Hivai Mital Husle Aka A Himom Imon Tahi Yoatabiz Puss Onlai Nike Case To Riad Wait, what do you mean only Nick has to read the Oh God's sake, Ken K. Legan Dairy Rarai Doktor Sp Here with your pizza Always Fialo Fiastaf the Protocols Thosi Excised Fial a uh, rise on ice and fate. We yep. have K, K nay day. <laughs> this is too bloody difficult. Okay, Sergio literally has the pronunciation written in his name, so I'm gonna have to be inventive here. Su so, uh, eh, eh, 
Oh, Sue Rice, Tahi, Skeep Tyke, Died, Yow, Know, Tahi, Skyn, Urn, Yow, Eel, Bow, Ice, Khaled, A, Wenus. That took more thought than was necessary. And in the $5 and above tiers, we've got Yakko the Volcanic Muto, Broski, SSS06, Dazzle Fizzle, and Council of Geeks. Thank you folks so much for your generosity, and thank you to you guys for watching. Be sure to have a nice day.